enters into Islam and why he's a Muslim, what are the requirements upon him, and then how does he leave Islam? Not that he wants to leave Islam, <laughs> in surprise. And in other words, what are the things that deny this Islam? So the first part, we have someone in Boulder, uh, Colorado, who's a little bit, <coughs> he's a little bit famous, uh, because he's a little bit strange. <laughs> One day in uh, the supermarket, the woman was going to give him a change, and he said, I will not, uh, I will not accept the change. Okay, you're just missing a couple of stories. Huh? <laughs> he said, I will not accept the change from you until you say, Sharon la ilaha illa Allah. And he said, he refused to find the woman who said, Sharon la ilaha illa And he made said, uh, he was very happy. He thinks that the woman by saying he said one day and lost my whole life is just into into Islam. Now that's kind of a strange case, but uh, even more more common case is, uh, for example, one brother. He's from overseas. He was going to marry an American woman, and this this woman was not uh, Muslim, so his family was a little bit upset that he's marrying a non-Muslim uh, woman from there. So his uncle, who supposedly has some knowledge in Islam, solved the problem by going to the woman and just telling the woman, repeat after me, Shalom la ilaha illa Allah Muhammad. And everyone said, Allah Akbar, and was very happy. And the woman thought she'd just gotten married. She didn't know what, <laughs> what she was going through. But this is a concept that many uh, people have. They think that they just say the Shahada, and they have entered into Islam. From a legal point of view, you could argue that. But more importantly, from our point of view, we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our shahada. This is much more important. If we look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, some people get confused because they take one hadith and they take it out of context. So they, take, they disregard all the other hadith. For example, there is a hadith that says, Man qala la ilaha illallah, dakhal al-jinnah. Whoever says, la ilaha illallah, will enter paradise. We think we say la ilaha illallah, you're meant to pray. But as any uh, good student of Islam knows, you cannot just take one evidence and pull it out and then make a conclusion from this evidence without looking to see what other evidence there is on the point. So if we study, for example, about the Shahada, we we'll see that there's much more than just this one hadith of the Prophet when he said, whoever says la ilaha illallah will meant to pray. And in fact, we'll see from the hadith of the Prophet that there are certain conditions that the shahada has to meet. And all of us should look ourselves to see to make sure that we have met these conditions. The first condition is ilm. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ And you have to have knowledge that there is no God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we make the shahada, for this shahada to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must have an understanding of what it means. Okay, a basic understanding. Of course, we don't have to have, you know, the fine details that this course has. But we have to have an understanding of what it means. To give an extreme example, if someone says, Shadow la ilaha illallah, and he means by ilah, or Allah, Isa alayhi salam. He thinks Jesus is God. So he said, there's no God except Allah, and he means by that, Jesus. He thinks Jesus is God. Obviously, obviously, this is not uh, proper shahada. So we have to understand what does this phrase mean? La ilaha illallah. Both the negation and the, and the confirmation. That there, there, is no, there is no being, no one that has the right to be worshipped except Allah. And who is Allah? Allah is the one who created us, who revealed the Quran and Sunnah, and who described himself in the Quran and Sunnah. So we have to, when we say the shahada, I think, inshallah, all of us when we say the shahada now, we, we understand and we know what it means. But when we deal with new Muslims, when we make da'wah, this is one of the points. That we have to make sure that they understand really what the shahada means when we say it. The second condition 
of the shahada is, is yaqeen. Yaqeen, how to translate yaqeen? Okay. What, is, what do you mean by that? I prefer to give it. Put it in the mouth. Put it in the understanding of the thing. Okay. You have to be certain, yani, without any doubt in your heart, that this thing is true. Okay. Because doubt, from Islamic point of view, doubt or shuk is cook. If you have any doubt, it's cook. So the Prophet says, he said, whoever says, La ilaha illallah with yaqeen, he will enter paradise. So that's one of the conditions. How do you get yaqeen? And some people have some doubts. How do they get yaqeen? Basically, there's uh, many ways. Number one is through increasing our knowledge. See, the situation of Islam is the opposite of the situation of the, of the Christians, for example. With respect to the Christians, the general people, and in Arabic what they call awam, these are the people who have the most belief in the Bible. They believe that every letter of the Bible is inspired by God. You know, people who have never really studied the Bible, they just call themselves Christians. While those people who study the Bible, they are the ones who are less, uh, who believe less in the Bible. They say, no, there's lots of human errors and lots of this things. In Islam, the situation is the opposite. The awam or the common people who don't study much, these are the people who have the most doubts about the Quran or most doubts about hadith. If they hear some hadith, since they don't know how the hadith were collected and everything, they have some doubts about hadith. While the scholars who studied it in detail, they have the most yaqeen. So one of the ways of getting yaqeen, getting this uh, certainty, is through increasing our knowledge of, of its now. Okay? That's two of the, of the conditions. By the way, there's eight. Uh, what's another one? Kumur. Kumur? You know, the part of the shi'a. Alim wa yaqeen wa so you don't answer anymore. Kabul, <laughs> <laughs> what is Kabul? Kabul is No, 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 no. Acceptance. Acceptance, okay. What we, what, we, what we mean by that is when you make the shahada, you must accept everything that that shahada implies. Okay? In other words, you don't have the choice, for example, to refer to the Quran and accept part of it, I would believe in this and I won't believe in that. I believe in salat and zakat and these things, but I will not, for example, the Muslim women, I will not believe in hijab or uh, this is referring to hijab. Or, uh, you know, you would believe in uh, salat or something, but you will not believe in the stories and the miracles that Allah presents in the Quran, for example. You must accept everything that is confirmed from the Quran Sunnah for jihadic speech. You don't have the right to accept some things and reject other things just on the basis of your own, own desire. Okay? As the one hadith, as the, uh, one verse in the Quran says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِمُكَ فِيمَا الشَّجِرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنْفُسِ الْحَرَجِ مِنْ قَدَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُ الْكَسِينَ This is uh, the verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by, by your Lord that there will not be believers until they accept you as the decider of, the, of, the, of their affairs amongst them, in other words, any affair, the Prophet says to them, if he makes a decision, uh, they have to accept. And another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if Allah and His Messenger have decided something, then the believers have no say in the matter. They have to accept. So we have to have that complete kabul, uh, a complete uh, acceptance. So that's, uh, how many have we here now? Three? I'm going to ask you all at the end to mention all all eight. Seven. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah
Yeah, I mean here we're talking about the shuroot or the condition of La ilaha illallah. Okay, it means that when you, when you, uh, when you, well, look exactly, that's the, the one you're, in particular here when we're talking about shirut la ilaha illallah what we mean by ikhlas is that you are saying shirut la ilaha illallah only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other words, you're not saying it because your family is Muslim, or you're from a Muslim culture, or your brother is a Muslim, or you might get some benefit. You're saying it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Now, alhamdulillah, for most of us who have converted to Islam, this condition isn't, uh, may not be uh, much of a, of a, what? Don't be surprised. <laughs> But for many Muslims from overseas, they never even considered the fact that they are Muslim for the sake of Allah. They are just Muslim because that's where they grew up. You know, if they grew up here, maybe they'd be Catholic. They didn't even consider it. They didn't even think about it. And when they make the Shahada, they don't make it. They never even thought about the fact that they're supposed to make it for the sake of Allah. In other words, you're supposed to be Muslim for the sake of Allah. Okay. What's another one? Nukiyah. Nukiyah. Okay. What's the meaning of Qiyam? Compliance. Okay. Okay. And Qiyam means to submit to the laws of Islam. Okay. Now, obviously, does that mean that uh, if someone commits a sin, he's not making Qiyam? No. Okay. Well, no? Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> well, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in um in um hadith Qudsi he says that he opened his arms wide so that the sinners by day can repent by night and he opened his um, arms wide by night so the sinners by night can repent by day. Okay, so, so what's the meaning of inqiyad the submission here? Meaning that you, you try to follow what you believe in Okay, you have the intention. Your intentions are that you accept the ability to follow what you believe in by practical action. As there was, um, I think, a lot of ambassadors used to say that the mind is something from and rooted in the heart and is born with you to by the action, by the social action. Okay, so what we mean by inqiyad here as the condition of la ilaha illallah means that when you say the shahada, you have the intention to do your best to fulfill the commands of Allah <coughs> Obviously, as uh, Brother pointed out, everyone commits sin. Okay? The important thing is that when you commit a sin, you consider that thing as, as something as, as, as being wrong and you must make uh, so of This is in Qiyad. So how many have we got now? About five. Five? Five? So what else? Okay. Again, as the shuroot of la ilaha illallah, it is close to ikhlas. In ikhlas, we said that we're saying the shahada only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, muhabba means we're doing it out of the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we would remake the shahada and become Muslims and enter into Islam because of our love for Allah subhanahu is a necessary uh, part of the shahada. Okay? What else we got? Sidq. Sidq. Okay, Sidq. What do we mean by Sidq? Sidq. Sidq. Okay, in other words, this one is, uh, inshallah, I mean, it's fairly obvious. It means that when we're saying it, we believe it in our heart. We're not saying like the, 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 the hypocrites, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that they come to the prophets and they testify that the Prophet is the Messenger of Allah and Allah knows that he is the Messenger of Allah and declares that the hypocrites are liars. Okay? So what we mean by Sidq is that we are saying it, uh, we say it with our tongue and we believe it in our heart. We're not saying one thing and we believe something else. Okay?
thinking. So that's all of it. Um, can quickly run out. Um, okay, knowledge. Say that in English. Oh, okay. Knowledge, certainty, sincerity, truthfulness, yeah. acceptance, yeah. Um, yeah. love, and compliance. Compliance, okay? Are those clear to everybody? Okay, we know, we know that this shahada uh, has to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for us to gain his pleasure and to enter further. So therefore we should, we should take any yani, time to think about these conditions and make sure that we have fulfilled them in our lives. Okay. That is now we are a true uh, believer in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Now when we enter into Islam, there's also certain requirements uh, from the statement or from the shahada that we make or from the the um, yani the shahad of la ilaha illallah one of these is okay, it's called tuhid al uh, has different names tuhid al sabbat or tuhid al atiqad what do we mean by what do we mean by that or, or also tuhid no, tuhid al atiqad You want to come across the, the expression before? We all know what Tawheed is. Okay, Atiqad is in, in our belief. In other words, after we enter into Islam, we always have to have this uh, belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that being that He has described in the, in the Quran. In other words, that He is all powerful, uh, He is all, knowledge, all knowledgeable, and makes the commitment they shape that there's nothing similar to him, okay? That's also very important because some people give, uh, give other people some of the rights that actually belong only to Allah. For example, there's some uh, groups of Muslims, you'll find it everywhere in the Muslim world, who go, for example, to graves and they, they pray to the people in the grave, thinking that the person in the grave will help them. This is what? Check. Okay, this goes again uh, to believe that, that someone else can, can help you. Or for example, if you look in the books of the Shia, like the Sul Kafi, they believe that the, the, the Imams have all of the knowledge of the world. Again, this is something only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. So this is one aspect, this is now while we're in Islam, after we made the shahada, we have to fulfill. The second one is Tuhid al Tuhid al Qat or Tuhid al Abada or Tuhid al Uluhiyya. They all pretty much mean the same. What's meant by this one? Anyone can call this term before? Tuhid al Abada, Tuhid al Uluhiyya. to make our worship solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the brother said and worship him in the way that he is uh, supposed to be worshipped according to the Quran and Sunnah so for example there, there, is, there was a Muslim country still a Muslim country now they used to have this festival one week out of the year Muslim country the population is maybe 70% Muslim one week out of the year they used to have a festival in which they used to make sacrifices to the gods of the sea. Okay? What is the, a sacrifice? You sacrifice for the sake of a person or being or a being. Sure. Okay? This is a type of worship, a type of ibadah. Yeah. So this kind of thing goes against the al uluhiyah or only worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also dua, making dua, the Prophet said, so the dua itself is ibadah. In other words, it is one of the, the best acts of ibadah. Supplicating or making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone makes dua again to someone in the grave or so, this is uh, against the tuhid or uluhiyya. Okay. The, the third one, the third necessary uh, aspect of 
of the Tuhid or of the La ilaha illallah is Tuhid al Hakimiyah. Tuhid al Hakimiyah, which is what? This time? Uh, no, we finished this. We finished the uh, Tuhid al Atiqad. Tuhid al Atiqad includes the mouth. Tuhid al Hakimiyah. Anyone heard the expression al Hakim before? Tuhid al Hakim. Okay, the prophet is the Okay. Not the Hakim. What's the meaning of Hakim? You have Well, Hakim is, is uh, one of the means of Hakim is the ruler. Okay. To hide the Hakim means we have to accept the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the supreme law. We don't have the right to make our own laws against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. That's why in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلُ اللَّهِ فَأُولَيْكَهُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ Whoever does not rule by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, and he's one of the... Are you talking about Tawhid of Rasulullah? No, it's called Tawhid al-Hakimim. Yeah, it's just a No, no, it's, yeah, and this... You're talking about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lordship, mm-hmm. the being the ruler, the Lord, the giver of the truth. No. No. No, but the way the way I'm discussing it now is a little bit different. No, I'm, I'm not denying it. Yeah. I'm just relating it because the, the, the Arabic term you used, I wasn't familiar with mm. that particular word. Mm. So I'm just trying to get to what I know so that I understand where mm. you're coming from. Yeah, Tuhid al-Arabiyya in this, in this division, this way of dividing it, comes under Tuhid al-Atiqad or Tuhid al-Tabat. That there's no creator except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is that? Now, so these, these, these three that I mentioned are required from every Muslim. If he has any shortcoming in that, he is outside the realm of to negate any of them. And we will discuss in more de- detail what are some of the actions that negate the one just now. So there's, there's two other things which are not uh, uh, necessary components, but if we fail in them, then we are committing a sin or we have uh, some shortcoming in our, in our fulfilling the shahad. The first of these is uh, to have the khuluq. You want to know what the khuluq means? To have the behavior or the etiquette, the manners or the characteristics which are representative of the shahad. What I mean by that is when we make the shahada, when we call ourselves Muslim, there are certain behaviors that we are supposed to have. Right? I and mean, obviously we're not supposed to lie, we're not supposed to cheat, we're not supposed to steal, and so forth and so on. This is part of the shahada, but it's not a necessary component. In other words, if we lie, if we lie, if we cheat, we do not become kept. But we have, we have a shortcoming in our iman and in our testimony of, or in our fulfillment of what la ilaha illallah should translate into in our life. So we should have the khulaq or the character that is representative of the shahada itself. Okay? And the second one, which is, again, I said, if we don't fulfill it, we do not become kafir, but uh, we have some shortcoming in our iman or in our shahada. That is to fulfill the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us uh, in the Quran. And what I mean by that is not just, for example, the salat and so forth, but also the, the greater commands that deal with society as a whole. Establishing the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, making Amr bin Maruf and Nahyan al Munkar, enforcing the good and eradicating the evil. All of this is part of the shahada. Okay? It's not a necessary component. In other words, if we don't do it, we don't become kafir necessarily. And it will be committing a sin. But it is actually part of the shahada. I know this is going individually, but collectively, these things have to be done. Well, well, there's different levels to it. Some of it can only be done collectively. You know, for example, some of the aspects of the hudud, you, know, you don't do that as individuals. No, 
but some of it is also on the individual level. I mean, you yourself may enter your own mosque and see something, you know, a statue or something in the mosque, and you have the ability to remove it. So you have to, in that case, in that case, remove it. So we see that from the, from the la ilaha illallah, there are certain things that that requires from us. If we don't do it, uh, we become kafir. And I will discuss these things in more detail later. And these, and these last two uh, are part, actually, of the shahada, are part of our statement that there's no God except Allah. But if we don't fulfill them, we do not become kafir. We're just sinners. That is having the khulq, the Muslim, or the khulq representative of la ilaha illallah and fulfilling these commands uh, related to la ilaha So now we get to those deeds uh, that take us out of Islam. Now many, unfortunately, if we look, for example, to Bani Israel uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with the Jews, they will call it, لَن تَمَثَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامِ الْمَعْدُودًا وَذَرَّهُمْ فِي دِينِهِ مَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in the Quran about Bani Israel that, or the Jews in particular, they believe that the hellfire will only touch them for a few days if it's going to touch them. And this is something that they have invented in their own religion. Okay, and it has deceived them. Something they have invented, it has deceived them themselves. Unfortunately, most, many Muslims also, they think the same way. If they enter into Islam, they call themselves Muslim, <coughs> And if they pray and fast, they are Muslim, and they will go to paradise, and they will uh, not go to the hellfire. But that's not the case. Salah Khazan in the khutbah he gave one time, he said that someone can nullify his, his uh, Islam in the same way that he nullifies wudu. In other words, he may say the shahada, and he may pray and fast, but he's doing things that will nullify his Islam, and nothing is left of his, of his Islam, in the same way that someone breaks his wudu and nothing is left his wudu. So we have to understand what are these actions that take us from the realm of Islam to the realm of Kufr. We have to understand and of course to avoid them to the best of our ability. And inshallah at the end, in case I forget, remind me to talk about what's the difference between doing an act which is Kufr and actually becoming Catholic. One of these uh, actions that take us from the realm of Kufr, uh, from the realm of Islam to the realm of Kufr, is shirk. And what does shirk mean? Associate partners with Allah Okay, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yasfiru wa yushraka bi, wa yasfiru ma dina darika ima yashak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive the one who commits shirk, or the committing of shirk, but he commits uh, a good he forgives whatever uh, is other than that to whomsoever he wishes. So a shirk is something that will land the person in the hellfire. Yeah. What are some of the ways that someone may commit shirk? Yeah. I mean, all of us know the word shirk, and we say, you know, the word shirk, but do you understand some of its manifestations? You can uh, 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 commit shirk by following man-made law instead of the law of Allah for one time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be the city of shirk, I believe. Yeah, if, if, uh, if you take someone and say that this one, this person is the lawgiver, okay, and you follow him and obey him, instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, it's a shirk. Mm -hmm. really that in many ways. that we could do which are shirk. Like praying to someone in the grave or bowing to uh, an idol or something like that. All of those are shirk. But also, 
as a Muslim, we are required to have certain feelings in our heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we give those feelings to anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is shirk. For example, as the Torah said, if we love other people, other beings, or other things more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is a type of shirk. Or we put our trust in someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or we fear someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you fear meaning in that case that this person himself has the ability to do something to him. And you fear in the case that this brother is quite big, <laughs> compared to me, fear in the case that he might, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him the ability to hurt me, and he may hurt me, that's something else. But to believe that he himself has the ability, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot protect me, that's a shirk. Well, that's what I said. That's what I tried to but even, so there is two aspects of it, but even the other aspect that fear really is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to allow him to do it. So everything is related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you get to that level of Iman, as one of the shaykhs mentioned in, uh, in his, uh, his talk, you realize that everything comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize that if you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've met the goal. And you don't worry about pleasing other people. You don't fear other people. Because you know that if all of mankind got together to try to hurt you, they could not hurt you unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you. So all you worry about is your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do to you. Okay. Another one is uh, close to, well, the second one is close to what you said. No? It's like, uh, is to believe that there's some guidance better than that of the Prophet. Better than what the Prophet. Okay. For example, if you believe that Islam is something old and it doesn't meet what we need nowadays and capitalism is better or socialism is better, this is good. Okay. Because the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that the guidance is the guidance of Allah. Okay. So if you believe in any system, any way of life, and think that that system or way of life is better than what the Prophet has and brought, this is good. This is good. You have a comment? Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's another one now. See, you may not hate Islam in this case I'm talking about. You may say that Islam is beautiful, it's great, but this way of life is better. Okay? Some people, for example, so be, some of the some of the Sufis, they believe that their teachings from some of their what they call the Odiyah or Qutb or Ghul is superior to what the Prophet has said brought. Cool. Maybe there's some guidance better than what the Prophet has said brought. Another type of kufr is to set up an intercessor between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the, at the, at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did the people before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They did, right? Did they believe even in some acts and wor of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay. So they have this they have this belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, had to fight with them and struggle for them. Pretty much we can say all all of his uh, life while he was a Prophet in five years. Okay. And what was the main thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described about them in the Quran? Okay. One of the main things is that they worship other beings and they claim that they are ways of getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say we only worship these beings because they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Set up anyone between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is good. To believe you have to go through a certain person or, or you make dua, even the Prophet وسلم, as many people do, they make dua to the Prophet وسلم, or they go through the Prophet وسلم, or they do deeds for the sake of the Prophet وسلم. All this is wrong. All this is wrong. 
How many of you have we have you think you think it's stupid? How many of you think it's stupid? Three? Okay, another one, also a very important one, is to dislike something of the religion. Okay. Even if you apply it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is because they dislike what something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed and therefore all of their deeds are destroyed or in vain. Even if you apply it, if you dislike it, it is cooked. Why is this cooked? Why is this something that's unacceptable? Okay, even if you don't say anything is better. Well, it's just the fact that you think that you dislike this, you must think it's something better. No, okay, it's let's assume you don't. Okay, just for the sake of argument. The point of that the revelation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and part of our belief is that we have to believe that Allah's knowledge is perfect, and His revelation is perfect. And so therefore, if you dislike anything from the revelation, you are distrusting, either you're distrusting Allah's revelation, that part of His revelation, or you are, you know, disagreeing with it or just not liking what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And no one from the creation has any right to uh, distrust or dislike the order and the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has perfect wisdom and He knows best for all times what He does for His creation. Okay. If, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to do something, okay, isn't that a sign that that deed is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay. We're in agreement on that. <laughs> There's many verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, orders us to do something, and then at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah, Hibbul Okay, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to do something, it means that that's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from something, what does that mean? It means that something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. Let's take the first case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us to do something. That means that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And we are going to say we don't like it. Okay? I mean, we are saying that we don't like something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Do you get my point? I and mean, we don't have that, have that right. If we're at that point, this means our iman, I and mean, we, we're at the very low <laughs> level of, of iman. Because it should be the case, and if we really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we love everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So if we dislike something, even if we apply it, then this is cool. And many of our sisters, especially uh, those who converted to, to Islam, I've heard them say many things about hijab, which is I mean, completely unacceptable. Okay. Even if we apply the thing, even if they are wearing hijab, they have to realize that that thing, hijab, is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves since the best for them in this life and the hereafter. So, the best for them in, in this life and the hereafter and it's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. How could they dislike it unless there's something wrong with it? So, disliking something in the Quran Sunnah, even if we apply it. Okay. Another one, I'm losing track of Number. If we have the film, we can just wait. Yeah, when I say disliking something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran and the Sunnah. That's another talk if you want to get into My special field is Hadith and Sunnah, so if you want to get into that. Mm, no. Well, يعني, uh, for example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran uh, about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَمَا يَنْتَقِيَ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحِيٍ يُحَىٰ Which is not speaking of his own desires, but it is simply uh, revelation. 
And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses talks about the fact that He has given the Prophet al-Kitab wal-Hikmah. And the ulama agreed that al-Hikmah means the Sunnah of the Prophet. Another verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the Quran. It says, Thumma inna alayna bayana. It is our duty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it is our duty to explain the Quran. Uh, and then in another, another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa unzila ilayka dhikr, yitubayyan in nas ma nuzila ilayna. If we have sent down to you the dhikr, meaning the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu in order to explain unto mankind what has been revealed to them. So if you put these two verses uh, together, it means the Prophet Sallallahu ex- explanation of the Qur'an, which is his sunnah, comes from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Plus he also said that uh, I have been given the Qur'an and something similar to it, which is the sunnah. And some of the Sahaba, they said that Jibreel used to come and teach the Prophet Sallallahu the sunnah in the same way that he taught in the Qur'an. So when I say, when, when I say it's just like something Allah revealed, includes both the Qur'an and the sunnah. Uh, it's like something that is uh, uh, cool. yeah. Maybe. You leave the middle. You leave Islam. Yeah. yeah, these things I'm talking about, uh, it is the yeah, Kufr uh, Akbar. What, uh, what is it if you can give you a return? No. How do you accept it? Yeah, Yeah, and if, if yeah, and he, it depends on his on his situation. If he is caught by the the rulers, if he's doing this, put in prison, then he just makes trouble by saying, and I will not do it again. I am sorry for what I did, and I ask Allah to forgive me. Okay? So that, if he's caught by the rulers because of this kufr, and he, then he has to make it public. But if it's just himself, he finds himself doing it, and later he wants to make trouble, and he just asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. something which he knows which is, is kufr. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the two things may happen to him. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may steal his heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran that those people who make kufr and then they become back and they make kufr and come back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally seals their heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't... Uh, and because they have this disease in their heart, so because of that disease, he seals their heart. In other words, they will not come back to it. But the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed to return, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always accepts it. If you go to, for example, uh, Surah Al-Buruj, if you're familiar, familiar with Surah Al-Buruj, where the, the story behind Surah Al-Buruj is some people took uh, some believers, and simply because they were believers, they put them in a pit and burned them alive. Even those people who did that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتْنُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا فَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْجَحَنَّمَ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابُ الْحَرِيمِ Even these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, with those people who did that to the believers and do not repent, then they will get punishment from here. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always open to, to repent. In other words, even if he did it over and over again, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him back to Islam, he will accept it. Thank you. 
Yeah. 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 When you're talking about to hit the law and the order of Allah and the Sunnah, what if someone who just feels ashamed to fly the order you know, because of his position in society or his age? Is it in certain categories? Yes, I guess it's very clear. I think the same they're not like him. Really, it's the same thing. The same thing is the same. He used the word ashamed. And it's called the, the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was supposed to please the people by not following the law of Allah. So if you prefer to please someone more than you prefer to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because psychologically, if you can do something, it doesn't mean that you should something. You do naturally, you don't like it. I mean, I don't like it. Okay, yeah, okay, if he's committing a sin, okay, but, but if, he's, if he's in that case where he described earlier, that he prefers to please the people instead of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a serious case, and because of hope, as we discussed earlier, is one of the, the actions of the heart that we have to put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. We cannot love anyone more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot be willing to please anyone more than we're willing to please Allah. So he's, he's treading in the dangerous areas there. So another thing which is unfortunately also very common, you'll find, for example, people, uh, people go to the mosque five times a day. Or people who wear beards, or women wearing hijab, and you'll find other Muslims making fun of them. Look at these people going to the mosque every day, five times a day, and they're growing their beards, or the women wearing hijab. Okay. What about this? This is kufr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kul abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasulihi kuntum tafdahdiyun, la ta'atsadiru, qad kafatum ba'di man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, was it Allah or his sign, or was it his commands or his messenger that you were making fun of? Do not make any excuse for yourself. You will make kufr after he met. Even if he prays five times a day and he prays all night and he fasts, if he does this, it's a kufr. And this is another point regarding the 
because even if the person is doing it for fun, and the person knows that the person is doing it, you can even do it jokingly. For example, if you're saying, well, the person says, well, I'm just doing this to have a good time. He's making fun of the way some sister wears a veil, or he's making fun of the way some brother goes to the mosque every day, just to make the people laugh. Even if it's cool to them. This is the example that you know, brought to the Hadith when the Prophet of Allah came to the man who was telling jokes about the Sahaba, the Yudhava Island and he and about the message of the law of And when the eye of this new rock was revealed, the man said, oh, but I was only playing, I was just joking. And the prophet said, um, you know, he sees his eye out. And he's welcome, you know, he's welcome behind his camel, of course, whatever he's driving. He's welcome to the desert behind him. It shows us, you know, how careful we have to be. Because many, in many, in some places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this, your deeds may be destroyed and you don't even realize it. For example, in Surah Al-Fajrat, talking about how to talk to the Prophet Do so not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet or your deeds may be destroyed without you even knowing about it, without you even realizing it. So this is why our knowledge is so important, to realize these things and do our best to stay with it. So we're joking about the religion, we're joking about something about the religion. It's, it's, not, it's completely unacceptable. Uh, we find that, uh, among, uh, uh, that uh, they can the yeah. 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 And then the brother can show it to you and show it to you and you'll be able to hear it. I'm sorry, but sometimes it comes from outside and makes some of us. Yeah. What does the Quran say about this? If someone jahil is making fun of the signs of Allah, what should we do? We have to meet them. Then they start talking about the And we can't just sit there accept it or laugh. <laughs> that goes uh, and then we said, this is completely, this is completely unacceptable. Little bit. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. Nothing wrong with that. If the person is alive, uh-huh. and he has the ability to do something, and he's got, I mean, the folks are building with all that kind of dialogue, but if he's alive and you ask him to do something, and you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can do it to you, nothing wrong with him. So you can ask someone to make dua for you. You can ask someone, for example, if I ask the brother to kill me. But even, even the Sahaba themselves, even in this, except for dua, they were very, very strict. They didn't want to rely upon anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the book that I was writing one time and he dropped his stick, and they refused to ask anyone to pick it up. He would stop himself and pick it up. And that's how much they, they want to rely just upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and themselves and not uh, rely on anybody. So to ask someone for that is not considered such a thing. So another, another aspect of kufr, another, word, another action that takes us from the realm of Islam to the realm of kufr, is to, to make wala for the for the unbelief. What's the meaning of wala? Loyalty. Loyalty. That's a good thing. To have loyalty for the unbelief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amnu, la ta'takhidu wa al-yuhud wa al-nisara awliya. Ba'duhum awliya wa ba'd. Wa man yatawallahum minkum fa'innahum minkum. The Prophet said, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this book, is saying that do not take the Jews and Christians as your oliyah, as your close friends, as the people who you're loyal to. They are oliyah one for each other. And whoever joins them, and he not join them in the sense of uh, becoming Jew or Christian, but join them in the sense of making wala for them, then he is one of them. In other words, he is left to them and he has nothing to do with the Jews. Oh, yeah, even if it's all the same. Yeah. 
Now, these, these, are the, these are the things that I'm discussing here that even if the person fasts and prays and says, he is denying the He is redeeming the
I'm not going to talk about the uh, good part of the This is the whole point. I need some details uh, the But there's some... But it's related to the point. But it's related to the point. For example, suppose you enter a, a mosque, or, I mean, there's a group of Muslims, but they do not give you, they do not treat you, for example, like the girls. So, you're between being with them, or being with the Jews and Christians, you probably treat you better. Yeah. What's the situation in that case? Especially what is their situation at the moment? Most of them, because they're the ones who are making the big thing. You know what? I, I, I don't want to interrupt, but we're the ones in the message of the message of Islam, you know. You know, you can kind of say that they're opposed to their parents, like they're not really uh, assuming their mind. Okay. So we come here with you, or we come to these mosques, and we all get together, and there's a controversy of character. Well, my point is this, that the brothers who come from the Middle East to Islam, the brothers in America, the ones who convert themselves from being Christian Jews, even brothers who are part of the nation of Islam, who come to that, and come into Islam, and then they encounter these brothers who, you know, they have their own group mentality, so to speak. You understand? Yeah, okay, I see. And then, when you're talking about teaching something about God, something about history 1400 years ago, and trying to bring it up to today, like to say, you know, uh, I said, well, then you're saying that they, I mean, they're conditioned, like, think of their conditions. Like, you know, like you're telling me, I mean, like, I see this as, you know, like saying, well, I know about the here and now. I know what's going on there and now. Okay? This is how I read people. All right? But we get around ourselves as Muslims. And I have a question. So why do Muslims fight each other? You know, they come from that rock around all over the Middle East. They come from over there. They come over here to get an education, so to speak. You know? You understand? Mm -hmm. This is somewhat related to... There's some, there's some minimum requirements of wala that every person must have for every other self. Every other Muslim. And if he doesn't have it, then he becomes that. There's another level where if he doesn't have it, he's, he's committing good sin, if he's not that. So there is that, and where, where if they don't have hope for you, I'll just accept one point on this, okay? And then I'll get back to the other for example, the minimum of love between the brothers. Okay? If, if this brother says he's Muslim, he says Shahada, I have no evidence that he's not a Muslim. The minimum love that I have for him, that I can have for him and still be a, a believer, is stated in the hadith of the Prophet. He said that no one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for him. So that is the minimum. If I go below that, I have, I have broken this one up and left. So there are things which are minimum that have to do with people. So, if they are not fulfilling it towards you, uh, that is their sin. And if it is not bad enough, it is even affect you. Of course, it is, it is, uh, it is a mutter. It is a mutter, a mutter, a mutter, a bite. You have to do the best if you can to do I have a question pertaining to a generic museum or a university in Philadelphia came across an article in the Philadelphia Daily News pertaining to an uh, authority figure, you know, I mean, a most, you know, a most, and this one particular individual had uh, attended one of his Japanese uh, you know, paying respect. Yeah. Or it was, I don't know if he actually, according to what I was told by another Muslim that I, that I trust, you know, he's, he's a very good Muslim. I, I, believe, I think it's good that he has seen a particular individual on television at the place. According to Atrahman uh, Bukhari, in his book, Al Wala Ud Dra, he said that attending the funeral of Ahl Dhimma, he's talking about Islamic faith. He said that this is okay, that it's permissible. He gave some evidence for it. Some other scholars have read, they said, no, it's not permissible. 
Mas só para mim que eu vou poner, eu vou ser imortal, 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 eu vou You give this to the camera, it's a type of cook. Another thing is bill, okay? For example, the Quran commands us in the Quran, uh, uh, commands us that if our parents are unbelievers, or if, if they order us yani, to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't know, okay? it still says that we have to deal with them are open. Okay? So bill in this case is that we deal with them in a kind manner, And we don't cheat them, we don't steal from them, we don't lie to them, okay? And we're doing it as a sake of da'wah, as setting an example for them that we are Muslim. The Sufian authority, one of the Tabayin, he said if you give a piece of paper or an ink container to, uh, to a non-believer, okay, and you did not do it for the sake of Allah, he said you have left with them. And that's how uh, extreme it is, yeah. but beer is allowed that we treat them and properly. So some ulama consider uh, attending their funeral as one of those acts of death that, that you can do. Other ulama say no, it does not fall into that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we talked about 
Through the Lord, the Lord, the first one is the Elm. In some knowledge that every Muslim must learn if he has to do it. He is not the key from that learning. So we may not call him Kafir in this life, but in the hereafter, if he did not even worry about learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may teach him that Kafir. So that's the much more important thing. From, from what I understand, like most of the great scholars like you can have in the numbers, that you, as you say, this is a company that is over that. You know, when you first the first of even the great Cooper that takes out of Islam, they would speak on it in terms of the concept, as far as trying to speak to specific people that didn't do that. Okay, because you could be, as I said, applied to someone, that person may have a misunderstanding or a misunderstanding on that matter. You could call someone a chapter, but it's really not a chapter. And with the, the Cooper, the, the, you could call someone a chapter for it, that's a good one. It's clear to that person. That the clear is plain to that person, he understands that this is against Islam. And he, he understands and he says, well, I don't care. I still want to do it like this here. Then that person is talking to that. But until that, you cannot call that person a chapter. Even if he's doing pure Cooper. If, so, so if, if someone is showing himself as a Muslim, of course, we don't know what's in his heart. If showing himself as a Muslim, we don't have the right to call him a Kafir unless we have a suspicion against him. At the same time, we don't have, some, uh, we don't have the right to, for someone who is clearly showing Kufr to call him a, a Muslim. Okay? Some converts, they talk, for example, about their grandmother. They said, oh, she was a very good woman. She loved everybody. She was very nice. She was a Muslim. No, we don't have that right. So we don't have the right to, to call anyone who shows himself as a Catholic, doesn't show himself believing in Islam, call him or her a believer. Let me ask one question called Dr. Salaam. I don't want to answer this really quick. Um, if a person says that he is in charge of the Jamaah, uh -huh. and everybody, you know, respect him as such, and he makes an agreement with the United States Army, saying that everybody in Islam will join the army and fight against the Muslim country even, you know, will fight even against the Muslim country because we are very considered. This is making well up. This is a boy, huh? This is a boy, huh?